This afternoon, I was allowed to take a sort of a mental flight from selected periods and to up to where we are now and ask myself a few questions. And the first place I would like to capture is about the 15th century when men's were, men and women were placed in a ship crossing the Atlantic Ocean on the way to the Caribbean. The commencement of this journey that we are discussing this morning. And I ask myself the same question, what noise, what objections? When men, while in shackles, saying that, reflecting on how will they escape, there were those who may have been protesting, saying we may need a referendum. It is not safe to escape because we are on a ship. But history would tell us there are some that did not survive the journey. They died trying to save their lives. But if we move on, Mr. Speaker, a little later to the period on the plantation, there were persons who, in the words of some historian called the, Mur the Murrans or what we would call the Negmawa, who did not wait on a referendum or even the proclamation of emancipation, but they went to the hills and started their own self-government because they decided that they are persons born in this earth as free moral agents. But during the same time, Mr. Speaker, I wish to submit, as recorded in the Guardian on 2nd of February 2009, saying that the first 20 years of the West Indies team existence, that there were no, there were exclusively white captains. So for 20 years, the West Indies team was not allowed to participate with captains from the region. In fact, there in the Guardian, it said that Tony Cozy wrote in his book that the refusal to appoint black captains because the ruling class considered that black, black man was not ready for leadership political, social, sporting, and otherwise. And if you link that to the noise that is being made today, that noise is literally consistent with that time saying that the likes of Clive Lloyd, Gary Sobers, the Darren Summy is not fit to be captain of the West Indies team and would need a referendum. Mr. Speaker, even then, when the announcement of emancipation was made, and the time of Sir John Compton and Sir George Charles, during that time, there would have been noise as well. But the struggle moved on. And today, I am privileged, and God has allowed me to be here with these honorable men and women to continue the secret work of advancing total liberation from our co colonial past. So the amendments here that is being recommended is not only to break up ties of a colonial system and to celebrate how far we have come by, by doing things ourselves, but it's also to bring justice closer home so that it can be accessible by the ordinary man. It is indeed about justice. And of course, Mr. Speaker, I wish to submit that part of the sustainable development goals that have been enshrined and that we have signed on to speaks to access to justice. Mr. Speaker, if you look at our Gini coefficient, one would ask, what is it that justice has to do with overcoming poverty? But the member who spoke this morning placed it well in context. That when persons have access to justice, 
the resilience, the participation, the whole principle of inclusion in society makes a big difference. Mr. Speaker, there was a time when persons of my growing up or my ethnic group would have given up lands in exchange for flour and sugar because they wanted to feed the kids. And within a short space of time, value of land increased and they saw multimillionaires on parcels of land that they once inherited. And there's no one to turn to because land speculators came into this country and of course, in a short space of time, a lot of persons who had a short parcel of land became landless. When I listened to the likes of our South African comrade who speaks about land, Julius Malima, it tells me that we need to be careful that we do not set up our population to become ruthless, to become reckless. Because when we choose not to take steps today, the generation coming after will certainly take matters in their own hands. So of course, the rule of law is a basic, basic precondition for sustainable economic development. And in societies with some legal protection, those who lack the resources for access to, legal, to the legal system are often denied. And these safeguards, they miss it out completely. And of course, it is estimated, Mr. Speaker, that four billion people around the world do not enjoy the protections afforded by law. The poorest and most vulnerable instead live at risk of losing their homes. Sometimes, Mr. Speaker, you could have stories where persons would have paid a large part of the mortgage and they believe that they have paid out the principal. But here comes the bank within a, a certain time, move on to them to take their homes. And while they pursue locally in the courts, that's the end of it, they are left to suffer. Having the, a court of that repute within the region provides an opportunity for persons to take those banks to task to the highest level that we could see an opportunity for ordinary solutions. The cost of going to England to challenge a bank who would have been strapped with expensive lawyers is not a possibility by the ordinary solution. Mr. Speaker, if serious progress is ever going to be achieved in overcoming extreme poverty, the poor must enjoy the rule of law and functioning institutions of justice. Otherwise, money will continue to flow towards the powerful and those who are more fortunate. Mr. Speaker, everything that needs to be said about this piece of legislation has been said, but I need to remind St. Lucians of just this one thing. This administration, the Labour Party, I have known for a fact, have always placed ordinary St. Lucians at the forefront of policies. And of course, when you think of the pillars for social protection, the agencies that contribute to the well-being of ordinary St. Lucians, be it the James Belgrave Fund that provide microloans, the National Conservation Authority that takes care of our coastal areas and provides employment for ordinary people, the St. Lucia Social Development Fund that continues to be a motion towards poverty reduction, the short-term employment program that is in the estimates that normally provides employment for thousands of persons, the public assistance program that takes care of our disabled people and persons who are receiving public assistance, the elder care program, the NICE program, all of these programs come from the heart of the St. Lucia Labour Party program. And I understand that it's quite natural that this administration would be the one advancing the Caribbean Court of Justice so that ordinary people could have access to justice at this point in time in our development. I dare say, Mr. Speaker, that the hope of a secure and livable world 
lies with the discipline of nonconformists who are dedicated to justice, peace, and brotherhood. I thank you.